The embargo for the review is finally lifted and now we can finally talk about what kind of performance you can expect from the Intel 12th Gen CPUs. And for our test this time, we'll be comparing the performance between the Intel 11th Gen and 12th Gen CPUs and see what kind of performance increase we can expect from the 12th Gen design. So what we have here this time is the 11th Gen i9 11900K and of course the highest end Intel has to offer for this round, the i9 12900K. So for a quick recap on what kind of improvement or new things you can expect is that the 12th Gen can boost up to 5.2 GHz. It's a little bit lower than the 11th Gen right here but it will be better. Then. Another thing is that they actually have a new design which instead of having just 8 core and 16 threads, you get 8 P cores and 8 E cores. And the total amount of threads you get is actually 24. It might sound weird but if we break down the design itself, the P cores will have 2 threads for each of the cores while the E cores will have only 1 thread, which will actually help with the performance because of what Intel planned for this time. Aside from that, you also get the long-awaited DDR5 and PCIe 5.0 standard. Although PCIe 4 hasn't been around on Intel platform for long, we're already seeing PCIe 5.0 on their latest platform. So that's something bit fast for Intel users, I would say. Now, aside from the difference on the specifications, we can also see difference in terms of the design, especially the size. Because if we take a closer look between these two, you can see that the 12 gens is actually longer. So they actually come with a new socket this time. Compared to what we have last time, which is the LGA 1200, the 12 gen CPU now uses the LGA 1700. Cooler-wise, some motherboard manufacturer might include some design on the CPU socket part to accommodate existing coolers for LGA 1200 to support the new CPUs. But you have to check whether it's actually applying even pressure to make sure that you get proper contacts. The 11th gen only supports DDR4 while the 12th gen supports both DDR4 and DDR5 actually. For 11th gen, it can support DDR4-3200 natively but for 12th gen, you can actually expect an even faster rate which is DDR5-4800 but for the models of motherboard that actually still supports DDR4 you will still be getting the same support as what DDR4 offers which is at 3200 As for PCIe 5.0 standard it's still very new and we actually haven't seen any consumer grade products that actually support the standards. So you might have to wait for a little bit longer before we can see any brands that comes up with device that supports PCIe 5.0 to actually perform on the 12th gen or any future Intel release that's about to come. Now for the performance, now for synthetic benchmarks, well, we can see a lot of improvement on the 12th gen, especially those that include multi-threading tasks. Thanks to the e-cores on the 12th gen, it can actually allocate the task to the effective cores so that it can help p cores to work better and you get an even better performance out of what you are doing. You can see that that's actually a big improvement, especially for benchmarks like Signbench R23, or perhaps if you do file compression, decompression like the 7-zip, you can see that the increase in performance is a lot, it's massive. Intel really stepped up their game to make the 12th gen a game changer for this time. And of course, some of you will be interested to know that how well does this fare against what AMD's top-end CPU right now, the Ryzen 9 5950X. For most of the synthetic bench with tests, most of the benchmarks shows that the 12th gen pretty much leads in most of it. So if you're planning to get a 12th gen CPU, especially the i9-12900K for 
content creation world. Yes, it's actually something that I might consider getting one myself as well. Now for the gaming performance, previously when we tested the 11th gen i9 11900K, you don't really see much performance right there, sorry to say. And 10th gen actually performs better than the 11900K on most of the gaming tests. So what happens on the 12th gen this time? Aside from these two, we also added in the Ryzen 5950X just to see what kind of performance difference we can expect from all the three CPUs. For 11th gen and 12th gen comparison, well, it's not hard to tell that the 12th gen is actually leading by a lot. But what about the top-end CPU from AMD? Compared to the specification itself, especially the amount of cores and threads the Ryzen 9 5950X has, the 12th gen i9 12900K is actually leading a lot. Now, that is only the performance you can expect from the stock settings. What if we overclock the CPUs here? For the overclock results, although the 5950X shows a significant improvement overall in games, it easily beats the 11th gen i9 11900K. But compared to the 12th gen i9 12900K, that's still quite a lot to catch up. So did Intel win for gaming this time? The numbers is pretty much self-explanatory, I can say. And it's no surprise why Intel actually mentioned this during their regional press briefing, which says the best gaming CPU Intel ever has. Now that we see the impressive performance the CPU can offer, many will be asking what kind of power consumption will this CPU be drawing from? On the stock settings, although the 12th gen i9 12900K is drawing slightly more power than the 11th gen i9 11900K, but the overall performance is better. So that slight increase in the power draw is still acceptable. And out of curiosity, we actually disable all the E-cores just to see how much power the p cost is drawing from the wall compared to what the 11th gen is drawing. It's drawing surprisingly reasonable power I would say compared to the 11th gen because it's only drawing 192 watts as compared to the 11th gen which draw around 240 watts. Though Intel recommend us to not disable the e cost because it will hinder the performance. You can of course improve the performance by not just increasing the multipliers on the p cores. you can also include the multipliers on the e cores as well. But it will draw slightly more power than the p cores, so you might want to find the balance point between both p cores and e cores so you don't draw too much power and end up overheating the CPU. Although the CPU can actually perform better if you have a powerful cooler to make it clock higher, our AIO just decide to give up when we hit 5.1 GHz, which is not really that good for 24-7 uses. For the stock settings, there's not much to worry about because most of the heat can still be handled by the cooler we're using here for the test, which is the ROG Ryujin 2360. So for the closing thoughts, what do you have on mind for Intel's latest 12th gen CPUs? Well, we didn't have the chance to try all of it in the lineup because of limited time and samples, but we did manage to try what Intel can offer this time. And I would say gaming performance wise, and some of the synthetics performance, which some can reflect real life performance, for certain tasks, Intel did step up their game and probably taking back the throne of best performing CPUs for consumer in the market for this round. That's pretty much we can present to you for now, but do expect for more follow-up reviews or data presentation in the future as soon as we manage to give the 12th gen a little bit more tests so that we can show you more benefits you can expect from the 12th gen and of course what kind of improvement other improvement you can expect on the 12th gen compared to not just their predecessor the 11th gen and also 
what the competitors AMD has to offer with their current Ryzen 5000 series. So I guess that's all for now. This time, what do you think of Intel's latest 12th gen CPU? Do you get it? Do you think it's good or otherwise? Do let us know in the comments down below and I'll see you guys in the next video and more to come.